أرجو رضاك يا الله أنت الرحيم يا الله هبني عطاك يا الله أنت الكريم منك العطاء يا الله أنت العظيم يا الله فيك الرجاء يا الله أنت الحليم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome back ما شاء الله that's good. Okay, welcome back to this fantastic, amazing Dubai International Peace Conference. So we got three mics and three sheikhs. Okay, so we're going to go straight to the mics. Establishing peace is the aim of this conference, right? So how can we best help to be part of establishing peace in our community, in our home? in the world, okay? So answer or questions on that particular subject and we're talking about, again, keep it succinct, because we've only got 30 minutes and we're asking particularly, like I said, people who are not yet Muslims to be given preference and we're gonna start with the sisters again, as I have been doing all the way through the conference. So sisters, let's have the first question, please. Assalamu alaikum, brothers. My name is uh, Dania, and I'm a property sales consultant. My question is, actually, I feel a little embarrassed asking this question, being a woman. But um, my question is, is cigarette, shisha, or hookah, makru, or haram? And, and if it is haram, what is the punishment that Allah is going to give us for this activity because most of my friends argue on this topic and they don't want to talk about it. Sheikh Awesome. Sheikh Awesome, maybe you can... Sheikh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalam ala rasulillahi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa mehtada bi huda. The majority of scholars say that these things are physically harmful for you. They are a waste of money. And hence, the Council of Scholars in Saudi Arabia and the majority of fiqh council around the world forbid such material to be consumed, whether cigarettes, tobacco, you can have different names, whether they are strawberry flavored or apple flavored, it doesn't make a difference. It is haram because it endangers your health and because it is khabith. If your child comes and says, can I have a cigarette? I said, definitely not. If he says, can I have some juice, some chocolate, definitely allow him. And Allah Azza wa Jal has described his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Quran by وَيُحِلُّ لَهُمُ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَيُحَرِّمُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْخَبَائِثِ Anything that is good, the Prophet makes lawful, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anything that is harmful and bad, the Prophet makes prohibited and Allah knows best. Okay, let's go to the middle mic, and I'd like to uh, ask Sheikh Tofi Chowdhury to answer this next one. Good evening. I'm Apoor Gupta from India. I'm working in Emirates, and I'm a Hindu. I just want to ask that I know Islam is all about peace, and uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, but is it really necessary to... Uh, convert into a Muslim to follow the Islam procedures and the good things about Islam? Great question, thank you. <clears throat> My dear friend, um, it's a really important question that you've asked. Is it necessary to become a Muslim? You heard from what I had to say uh, that there is no real pleasure that you can find in your life except by submitting to a higher being. And there is no higher being that you can tell me that has all the attributes that are worthy of someone that we should worship except the God that is described in Islam. Show me a religion that describes a being that is more worthy of being worshipped than Allah. How we describe Allah, 
the one, the only, the beautiful, the loving, the mighty, the powerful, the first, the last, the supreme, the sublime, the one who knows everything, the one, his honor and his majesty is above everything else. There is no other religion that describes a God as powerfully as we do, as Muslims do. So if your happiness in this world is subject to you being a slave to something else, and whether we like it or not, human beings are slaves to something or the other. We are the slaves to our desires or to money or to a type of God or the other. Why would you rather be a slave to money or to your family or to your husband or wife or to your boss at work? Why would you not be slaves to Al-Malik, the one and one truly king, the God of the universe, who is Allah? So if you want true happiness and goodness in this dunya, in this world, and of course subsequently in the hereafter, then absolutely you must, you would be foolish to not accept this religion. And I say this with full conviction and with total respect for what you are upon. I say this with total respect for the life that you have chosen. But my deep desire for your goodness and my deep love for you to see the same happiness that I have in my heart, I say to you very clearly, Akhil Kareem, you must accept Islam. How can you not do so? If you know the sweetness that is in my heart and in the hearts of these brothers next to me, and in everyone here, when we read the Quran and when we bow our heads to Allah, then you would fight me for it. You would fight me for it. And so it is for this reason why I urge you to accept Islam. Zakhalakh, Sheikh Tawfiq. Let's move on to the next sister in the queue, please. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sana. I have a relative in the US who told me that it is permissible to eat uh, meat in the U.S. because it is slaughtered according to halal style. I just wanted to know if that is true and if it is okay to consume this meat, whether it is chicken or lamb or beef. So should we give that to Sheikh Awesome again? Yes, that's fine. Sheikh Awesome. To answer this question properly, I would probably need a whole lecture, but to put it in a nutshell, Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Al-Ma'idah has permitted us to eat the meat of the people of the book. And when you go to the tafsir, Ibn Abbas says that the slaughtered meat of the people of the book. So we have a difference of opinion among scholars. What I adopt is what Shaykh Ibn Uthameen, may Allah have mercy on his soul, by saying that if the country is a Christian country the majority of the people are Christian so I can eat the meat found and sold by their market providing it's not pork of course so if it's beef or mutton I can eat that without the need of investigating as long as I do not have any evidence to make me doubtful such as if I go to Belgium or to Luxembourg for example I don't know Maybe they have something legislated that prohibits the slaughtering of any living creature. So by default, no one can do that. In this case, I'm not allowed to eat. But if I'm in the UK or in the States and I don't have such knowledge of a legislation available, in this case, I would say Bismillah and I would eat. The evidence, the Prophet ﷺ was invited by a Jew woman and no one would accuse me of being semicist or anti-semitism or whatever. Huh? She, she was a Jew. That's her religion. She invited the Prophet ﷺ to a sheep and she stuffed it with poison. The Prophet ﷺ accepted the invitation. He did not say, where did you buy this sheep from? Though he knows that the Jews use their money from interest and usury. He did not ask. He did not say, was it slaughtered or you got it from a mountain where she fell and died? He answered the invitation and ate from it, sallallahu alayhi wa And this is the fatwa. If you want to be a little bit higher in this level, you say, no, I'd rather refrain. Nobody is forcing you to eat, but do not force people not to eat. This is their choice that is given to them in Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. 
That you believe in Allah. Believe in Allah. Divine guidance for human beings. Believing in the angels, believing in the books that were revealed by Allah. Believe in the prophets in the prophets. Obligatory, mandatory, compulsory. And that you also believe in the last day. And number six, that you have to believe in the Qatri. Abu Sama al Dhabi. Welcome to Islam 101. Islam 101. Program in program which we're going to do our best, do our best to give a clear and concise clear and understanding and explanation, explanation about the basics about of the religion of Islam, his tenets, his tenets, his tenets his beliefs, his, beliefs, his, practices, his practices. Discover the dynamism of Islam embedded in divine directives for its believers in Islam 101 tomorrow at 5 p.m. and repeat telecast at 3.30 a.m. Saudi Arabia on Peace TV. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? The concept of jihad. Who are terrorists? Watch Dr. Zakir Naik who marry more than one wife. They are labelled as terrorists, fundamentalists, who spread the religion with the sword. Misconceptions about Islam in Truth Exposed, next on Peace TV. My name is uh, Neba. Good evening to everyone. I'm a new Muslim. And uh, my question goes to Norman. I want to relate coexistence that you talk of to judgment because I see that the human race has created a lot of differences and we are living in fraction. So my question is, does Allah has a plan to, to harmonize his creation, to bring everything, to bring his creation to unity okay. and coexistence? Yes, Allah does have a plan. The plan is called the Muslim Ummah. That's the plan. The plan's already there. The instruction manual's already there. The people qualified to do this, He's the one who chose you. He selected you based on your qualifications. And he didn't put any difficulty on you. We are there. and So you can be witnesses against humanity by the peace that you deliver. All of the ingredients are there. So in other words, Allah will bring peace. Allah already did bring the ambassadors of peace, the givers of peace. That's why we're called Muslims. The word Islam actually is interesting. Because it has duality in meaning. Islam is, on the one hand, it means submission, but also it means to give or to offer peace also. To put someone in peace. So when we do our job as Muslims, then Allah's plan is fulfilled. And when we don't do our job, we don't get to question Allah. How come you didn't bring peace? He gets to question us. How come you didn't do your job? It's going to be the other way around. Thank you. I'm, I'm convinced. Inshallah. Zakhla khair. Noman, mashallah. Uh, let's get to the middle microphone and again, preferences. Do you know who? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Brothers, it's uh, really lovely to see the peace and uh, unity talks, but um, truthfully, how can we uh, truly achieve peace when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a strong hadith that there will be 73 sects and only one will go to Jannah and Muslims will always uh, argue with each other to prove that they are right. So how can you really, truly achieve peace? You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He created creation, the angels were surprised and they came to Allah and said, أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِقُ الدِّمَا I mean, oh Allah, we're not understanding what your reasoning is that you have created human beings that are weak, that are frequently argumentative, that are hasty, that are miserly, right? All of these characteristics Allah has created us. And so the angels saw our nature and they said, you know what? These guys are going to destroy themselves. They're going to kill. They're going to spill blood. They're going to divide into sex 70, 71, 72, 73. And so the angels saw that. What did Allah say? Allah says, 
What does it mean by that? He means I have a divine plan which you don't know. So what was Allah's divine plan? It was simple. What does it mean by that? It means Allah's divine plan was knowledge. Allah was going to save humanity through knowledge. When we gain knowledge and we learn about Islam and we learn about each other, we learn about our needs and how we can live together. When we learn about the Quran and the Sunnah, that is the knowledge that will stop everyone from destroying themselves. And that's when Allah says, Alam akullakum inni a'lamu samawati wal ard. Meaning, did I not tell you that I have a wisdom behind every single thing that I do? And that's when the angel said, Subhanaka la ilmana la illa ma'allamtana. Glory be to you, O oh Allah. We didn't know the wisdom behind it. Only you have the wisdom behind it. Do you understand? It's knowledge, Akhi. The problem is not how Allah has decided it. The problem is, are we really gaining knowledge? When will we divide? We will divide when we're ignorant. When will we come together, respect each other? When we gain knowledge, and that is the time when the sex will become irrelevant. The sex are there because they don't study. They don't gain knowledge. People don't go back to the Quran and Sunnah. When they do, they don't act according to it. If they did so, if people did so, sex wouldn't remain, other religions wouldn't remain, people would all come back to submission to one God. Allah knows best. Sisters, next question, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, my name is Sundas. Um, my question is uh, generally to all of you who can answer. Um, the women that go to Western countries usually get harassed, especially hijabi or niqabi women. And uh, I would like to know how to deal with people like that. You know, we have family in Western countries. Uh, you know, and Sheikh Tawfiq and I, at least, you know, and we've spent, he spent quite a bit of time in the West as well. So, and there are instances where, you know, things are said. But overwhelmingly, I think that the Western countries have provided an opportunity, except, you know, certain European countries I can understand, it's far worse. But in a case like the United States, uh, you're asking for a lawsuit if you mess with a Muslim woman. You know, there are, you know, when we first moved to Texas, we were really scared because, you know, Texas, pishu, pishu, you know, our vision of what Texas was going to be like. But, and when we moved, one time my wife was standing in line and she wears the niqab. So when she's standing in line at the grocery store, somebody in the line said, go back to your country. You know, so, and she turned around and said, I was born in California. Where do you want me to go? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so we can stand up for ourselves. And actually those kinds of circumstances, they are there. And I think they are not just a challenge, but an opportunity for our women to learn to stand up for themselves and not take this garbage from anyone. And we have to stand by our women and allow them to function in any society in the world, you know, in a dignified fashion and not take this from anybody. You know, it's, it's high time that Muslims take pride in their faith and they take pride and confidence in who they are. And once we learn to do that, this is not being aggressive. This is just standing up for yourself and human dignity is a part of peaceful existence. If you don't have dignity, you don't have peace within yourself, you know? So we have to do that. We have to learn to deal with that. And those of you that are from Western countries that have experienced this kind of harassment, I would urge you to raise your daughters to learn to stand up for themselves despite all of the challenges that are outside, inshallah, and still wear their religion with pride. Just to add on to what my brother said, uh, brothers and sisters, it's the way of the cowards to pick on the weak ones. You know what you know bullying is? Bullying is a guy who thinks he's strong, picks on someone weak in the playground, and tries to harm that person through verbal or physical abuse. This is what is happening today. They're trying to bully the Muslim woman, thinking that the Muslim woman is suppressed, she's oppressed, uh, she is under the thumb of the men, she needs to be liberated, and she needs to be mocked at and jeered at and made fun of. I think it's high time that sisters take the upper hand in these matters. And that's why I know our brothers and myself as well, we work towards this. We want female scholars. We want females to take up that responsibility in their own hands. Do not give up the hijab. Do not give up the niqab. Don't give up your dress. This is who you are. This is your life, your well-being. They are attacking our way of life and they're attacking our right to decide the way we want to live. They have no right to do so. So at the end of the day, my sincere request is for sisters in Islam to strengthen yourselves, 
and to build strength within yourselves and to become from those people that can help your own affairs, inshallah. And we're here to give you that platform, inshallah. Sakhalah khair, Sheikh. Excellent. So let's move on to the next question. Asalaamu Alaikum. Alaikum Asalaam. My name is Farhat. I'm doing my master's in Dubai. Brother Rahman, I'd like to uh, present this question to you. I've come across a lot of people who, although they are uh, living in a very multicultural, diverse place like Dubai, they still fail to have uh, social relationships with people from different faiths. Uh, they find it really difficult to speak normally with uh, non-Muslim brothers and sisters. They may work with them, they may live around with them, but they fail to have us any social relation with them. I don't know what fear is there. Is there any social uh, problem with this or is there any ruling in Islam from refraining from something like this? I don't know about a ruling. Uh, I could tell you though that uh, this is normal. People like to stick to others that are like themselves, right? That's a, a common sociological phenomenon. I spent most of my adult life in New York City and New York City, many small countries inside a city. There's Chinatown, there's, you know, Jackson Heights, which is entirely Punjabi. There's an area that's entirely Greek. There's a story that's entirely Arab. You know, you go to parts of Brooklyn, they only speak Hebrew. You go to other parts of Brooklyn, they only speak Urdu. You know, it's crazy. It's, it's very fragmented, you know. So naturally, people like to go closer and interact with and be friends with people like that are most similar to themselves. That's there. But the Muslims have to be above this natural societal tendency. It's not a haram tendency. It's a natural tendency. We like to be in our own comfort zone. And people who you share a language with, who you share a religion with, who you share habits and customs with, obviously you're more comfortable around them. But we as da'is, we have to come out of our comfort zone and we have to be able to reach out. And if they're not reaching out to us, we should be reaching out to them. And if, for example, you're going to lunch, right? You work with somebody who's a Buddhist or something and you're going to lunch. Hey, you want to come with me? Let's go do lunch. Just, just be friends. You don't have to give him da'wah right now. Let's just be friends with him. Just, you know, because a lot of times these people, they feel like Muslims don't even think of them as human beings. They don't even talk to us normally. And that's, that's wrong. And the only time we talk to them is we want to preach to them. No, 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 no. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi built a real relationship with his people. It's even an evidence in the Quran, in Naka Ala Khuluqin Azim, the entire early seerah, pre-40 years of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, these relationships that gave him the credibility, right? So... Those of us that are now, inshallah, after hearing this message of become more conscious, you have to go out of your way. Don't say, why do people not do this? How come people aren't this way? No, 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 forget about people. How come I am not this way? There's a lot of people here. There's thousands of people here. If each one of you made a change, there's a real change in Dubai, isn't it? It's a serious change. So just, it's, I mean, think about that. So just reach out and be not saying, go join them in the temple and sit with them. You know, like, that's not what I'm saying. But at least... You know, break the ice, break the ice, and, and be able to have, you know, a good relations with our non-Muslim friends and neighbors. Sheikh, would you like to add something? Probably, probably. Um, see, interacting has two ways. Something on the surface and something that is internal. So on the surface, we coexist. We speak and we're kind and we're honest and we don't cheat with everyone regardless of their faith. This is a rule of thumb. In Islam, it's a religion of balance. It's a religion of pride without arrogance, a religion of strength without violence. It's a religion of compassion and mercy without weakness. So when I deal with a non-Muslim, I follow my role model, the Prophet I take every step possible to call him to Islam through my actions, through my sincerity, through my truthfulness, through everything that Islam tells me to do. The Prophet ﷺ had a Jew servant who got sick. The Prophet himself, the head of the state, went to visit him in his house. And his father was there. And he said to the Jew, embrace Islam. He visited him, but he gave him da'wah. It was not just hanging out. We don't have non-Muslims that we hang out with and we treat them and love them more than the Muslims know. We have to call a spade a spade. But we don't treat them in a harsh fashion. 
We're not violent to them. We give them everything in our possibility and ability to call them to Islam through our conduct. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ There is no one better in rhetoric more than he who calls to Allah وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا does good deeds وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ and proclaims that he is among the Muslims. Do this and everyone you know would, if not accept Islam, would be amazed and impressed by it. And Allah knows best. Jazakallah khayran. Just may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them all with a janatid fi al ala. Ameen. He created the universe. To him belong the heavens and the earth. The ever living, he is the first. He's the owner of mercy. He sent his messengers. On his creatures of the grave dangers of worshiping other than Allah. There is none greater than the